everyone. Uh, this is John Ehrman from Meridian Institute. Uh, we support the work of the TFA Secretariat and I've been asked to serve as facilitator moderator of today's webinar. Welcome. And um, I'm going to just quickly uh, review the agenda at a high level and then I'm going to turn it over to Fabiola Zabini to say a few words about the background and context for the webinar and then and introduce our, our speakers and then I'll say a bit more about how we'd like to uh, facilitate the conversation today. Uh, the agenda has been put together uh, in, in three uh, areas. The first will be three opening speakers who again will be introduced in a moment uh, to provide a, a broad context on issues related to traceability uh, and monitoring of indirect cattle suppliers. Uh, then we'll have five panelists who will provide information on various initiatives that they are engaged with uh, from various perspectives. And then we will have uh, hopefully 20 to 25 minutes for open discussion and questions from all of you. I'll say a bit more about how we would like you to uh, pose your questions and engage in the discussion as we go forward. But first, let me uh, hand it over to Fabiola for some opening thoughts and introducing our panelists. Yeah, great. Thanks, John. Thanks a lot. Thanks, you all, for participating at this webinar. Um, it's important to say that this is the first webinar organized by Latin America Working Group which for us it's really it's really relevant mainly because two reasons um, first is uh, it's an opportunity to strain the Latin America working group as a political instance uh, of TFA one more you know in the as an open space where you really can address your questions and you can uh, help to build an answer to that you know. and it was exactly what happened here the cattle sector in Brazil, as all of us know, it's a key issue uh, related to the zero deforestation agenda, not only in Brazil. I think that not only in Latin America, but in all over the world. So we know that the current context uh, claims, demands a huge uh, amount of dialogue to really be addressed in a positive and in a constructive way. So uh, TFA doesn't have a role to judge, but we can uh, play a very relevant role to bring, to talk about the solutions and to take a better advantage of this situation to uh, really, really increase, improve the quality, the social and environmental quality of the cattle sector in Brazil. And with this helping for sure to uh, uh, qualify you know, uh, uh, the, the, the objectives and the results of our agenda, globally speaking. Um, and in fact, we do have several partners inside the network who really understand and, and who really are experts on that. You know? And this is um, why it was quite easy to build this webinar. And I really uh, want you to, to to say that a, a big thanks uh, for those who accepted and for those who asked to be part of this webinar. And I will nominate them because it, it, it's part of uh, all of this that we are, they not only will speak here, but uh, they also help it to organize all of this and to make it possible. So Simon, Isabella and Pedro, thanks a lot. And also Leila from Agroeconi, Chris, Christopher Finney from the Nature Conservancy, TNC, Lohan Miko from PEXA, Alini Lox uh, from Alianza da Terra, and uh, Francisco Beduski from GTPS. Thank you all of, and let's, let's start the webinar. Thanks, John. Thank you very much, Fabiola. Let me just say a word about how we would suggest uh, we all participate in the webinar to hopefully be efficient with our time and to get as many comments and questions and discussion into the flow of the webinar as possible. So I, I note from my screen we have about 40 people on the, uh, on the line, which is excellent. Um, what I'm going to do is ask that we first go through the three opening speakers, Simon, Isabella, and Pedro, um, and then we will pause for any questions uh, or 
uh, of clarification that you have on their presentation. Um, if you wish to pose a question, we have a chat function that hopefully you, you see some chats already from Anna and others in the right hand side of your uh, screen and we would ask that you indicate the nature of your question and then I will try to get as many of those questions in in that period as possible. We'll ask that you please keep your questions as concise as possible so we can we can have as many. I would again encourage the first round of questions after the opening three panels to be of clarification not of of discussion. We'll do that later. Um, then we'll go to the uh, to the panelists, to the five panelists that uh, Fabiola just introduced to you. And uh, again, uh, pause at the end of that for any questions or clarification, but hopefully move into a discussion period where people can raise issues, ask questions, pose uh, anything you, you would like to in terms of the nature of this webinar to any either individual panelists or to the group as a whole. And again, we would ask you to use your chat functions so that we can see who has which question and I can make sure we're getting a good variety of topics covered through those questions. I, I apologize in advance if we don't end up having adequate time for everyone's question, but we this is being recorded and we will be able to follow up with you if there's a question that, that you're not able to get response to in the time, in the 90 minutes we have allocated for the, the webinar. I would also um, uh, ask that the um, the speakers do their best to keep to their uh, appointed time frame, which we've asked them to keep to five to seven minutes each. And I realize that's that's very constrained for the for the excellent information that they have to share. And Anna from the Secretariat will be uh, teeing up the slides in support of each of these presentations. So you should be seeing slides uh, on your screen. And I would ask the speakers to, if you need something done with the slides, just to make a comment and, and Anna can support you um, by moving the slides forward. I am going to be strict on this timekeeping, so at about six minutes I will interrupt the speaker and, and let them know they have about a minute left. So I know that they will not be able to present everything they wish, but it, we do want to keep the time so we have that time at the end for discussion. I'm going to stop there. Again, use your chat function if you have any questions. Uh, if you have any connectivity issues, please communicate with, with Anna uh, as indicated in the email invitation. And with that, I'm going to uh, ask Simon Hall from NWF to start us off with the first uh, set of comments. Simon? Hey, thanks, John. Um, Anna, I just wanted to, so I'm, I'm calling in, um, having some technical issues, but hopefully this, you have the slides up for everybody. Yeah, and Simon, please uh, do your best to speak loudly. You have a little background noise. Okay, yeah, I'll try to speak up. Um, so hopefully, again, I, you know, I'm, I'm just calling in on the phone. For some reason, the, the, the webinar conference service wasn't working for my computer despite our uh, <laughs> pre-testing efforts yesterday. Okay. Um, so ho hopefully, hopefully you can see the first sort of welcome slide that just um, has sort of my contact information on it. And again, I'll try to be to stick to time here, but my email's there, and I'm happy to take questions during this session or just can uh, reach out to me offline. Um, so if we move to the second slide, um, we'll just do a, I just wanted to do a quick outline. So we weren't sure, I wasn't sure, you know, exactly who we would have as part of this webinar. Um, so I figured we'd, um, just to kick things off, start with a really, um, you know, general high-level overview of some of the key things. So, you know, what are direct, indirect cattle suppliers in this context that we're talking about? Um, what does sort of a simplified supply chain structure look like in the context of at least the Brazilian production systems? Um, you know, what's the current status of some of the zero deforestation sourcing um, that, that we're seeing right now in the market? Um, what is the uh, significance that indirect suppliers play both within the, the structure of the, the different production phases, but also in terms of, of deforestation and some of the um, commitments from companies? And then um, I won't spend too much time on the indirect supplier working group, the GTFI, because we'll have some of the other um, speakers. I know um, uh, Pedro from Amigo Satel will specifically touch a little bit more on that, but just introduce that, that that exists and is working on some of these issues. 
and then quickly um, just wrap up with a few sort of high level things that um, from our perspective we see as um, important things that are needed for as next steps so moving to the next slide this just really uh, quickly introduces the difference between a direct and the indirect uh, cattle supplier um, in the context of the, Brazil, of the Brazilian production system. And so briefly, you can see sort of we can understand a cattle rancher in the most general terms as either indirect or direct. So a direct supplier in this sense is any rancher that would sell um, cattle directly to a meat packer. Um, and in this context, the indirect supplier in this sense is anybody that sells to anyone else, not a meat packer. So it can be ranch to ranch transfers, can be auctions, can be um, any sort of other movement of animals um, basically before um, sale to meat packer slaughterhouse. So that should be quite intuitive, but just to help sort of that, that everyone's on the same page with the terminology that we'll be using. Um, if we move into the next slide, um, I can just present a really sort of simplified cattle supply chain structure. And there's a lot of different ways to visualize this. Um, and I, and I hope, hopefully we'll see a, a few more examples with um, a little bit more detail um, added into it. But it just as a simple way of understanding it, you, you can break down before it gets to the, the um, meat packer level. There's three primary production phases. Um, and those include breeding, rearing, and then the final fattening stage. And then obviously the, sa the sale of the animals to the meat packer. Um, and so there's different combinations of these sort of individual production phases. This diagram here is highly simplified um, and sort of it shows a fully disaggregated um, system. And there's different sort of combinations of those. And hopefully we'll see a little bit more from some of the, um, the next uh, presenters about sort of this, you know, starting with the simplify model, how much more complex it can get quite quickly. Um, the, as you can sort of see the, the green sort of arrow the, there with the link between the fattening, that final stage, the fattening phase, and the meat packer, in general, the uh, three largest meat packers operating in the Brazilian Amazon have uh, established quite sophisticated monitoring and purchase control systems to um, enable uh, the block to block purchases from their direct suppliers that with uh, deforestation and, and um, other uh, and illegal illegalities and so these systems these these commitments and the implementation of these commitments which have come in the form of fairly sophisticated monitoring and purchase control systems have been established for a few years now um, they've they they do um, uh, audits the audits are um, uh, reported, disclosed publicly. They're third-party audits. And so the, the connection between those three meat packers and their direct suppliers, at least in the Brazilian Amazon, there are um, fairly effective controls for, for that phase. What still has yet to be fully addressed and remains one of the key challenges on the next steps for uh, full uh, deforestation-free production and sourcing of cattle from the Amazon and other biomes is this indirect supplier link. So the breeding and rearing, and as we'll see later, as I mentioned, sort of the different combinations of these phases. Um, but right now, currently, in this sort of simplified model, the breeding, the rearing, almost no monitoring, no traceability, which um, and uh, which poses um, uh, risks for potential buyers. And so this is, this is um, helping just um, illustrate sort of the controls that are in place for direct suppliers and then the need to expand these controls for indirect suppliers. Um, so then if we move to the next slide, the fifth slide there, um, this is just a, a quick slide to introduce some of the, the work that's been done, at least at the direct supplier level, the meatpacker commitments in conjunction with other public policy controls. Um, this should be quite familiar to many people that, that are on this call, the um, tremendous success that Brazil in the legal Amazon has experienced with the re, uh, vast reductions of the rate of deforestation since the sort of the, one of the peak periods around uh, the mid-2000s, 2004 in particular. Um, and we can see that this, this, this chart also includes soy, but if we look at the blue line there, juxtaposed with the orange bars, orange bars showing deforestation, the line um, 
showing blue line showing cattle production and then uh, green line and below that showing soy production we can see that um, the, both of those major commodity uh, systems have and um, have been able those sectors have been able to expand while the rate of forest loss has has declined declined precipitously during this period. Simon, you've got um, about uh, one minute, one minute left. Okay, great. And so here is to just note the recent upticks that we've seen um, in uh, 2015 and 2016. So we move on to the next slide just to quickly speed through the last bit here. Um, you know, what's the importance of indirect suppliers in this broader work? And so we, you know, it's hard to get exact numbers, but about a third of ranchers or so could be classified as sort of indirect suppliers. Um, smallholder settlements are an important part of this, um, and we see evidence that deforestation is actually still on these indirect supplying ranches, even within these sort of quote zero deforestation supply chains that the meat packers have for their direct suppliers. Um, and so I know I don't have that much time, so I'll just quickly move on to that last slide. So what's really needed? Um, and, and hopefully this will tee up some of the other presentations. So coordinated supply chain support is certainly needed. This is happening at least for indirect suppliers through the indirect supplier working group, the GTFI. What are some of the traceability solutions that can really be advanced um, to help close some of the current monitoring and gaps here? And so from the GTFI, there was a recognition that both the CAR and the GTA integration would be both cost effective, be able to be deployed rapidly, and be scalable at a national level. So CAR, the Rural Environmental Registry, and the GTA, the Animal Transit Guide, which is a documentation that tracks animals as they move and was um, uh, put in place for hoof and mouth disease and other sort of vaccination records. Expanding meatpacker implementation, the big three that I mentioned obviously have these commitments in place for the Amazon, but there's a need to also build upon this uh, work and, and expand these out to the smaller, medium-sized operations, and then obviously adapt this beyond the Amazon to other important biomes such as the Tejado. There's certainly technical support and economic incentives um, needed for producers. Um, this is something that is, is, comes up quite a bit and is, is, I think everyone agrees on is a, is a top priority. From the re retailer brand perspective, I think what's needed is preferential purchasing commitments and, and other sort of support um, in, the, in the form in, of incentives for meat packers that actually are making mean, meaningful progress towards these goals. And then from the government, the, the public policy side, these, these systems that could provide a tremendous benefit for traceability, monitoring, and, in, in, and to improve um, the sustainability of, of, the, of the cattle sector in, in general, rests in the GTA in the car. And so those, the access to those information systems has been um, not always as transparent as would, would have uh, be hoped. So the government can help support access to those, which would really improve the level of traceability and monitoring and would enable companies that do source cattle products from Brazil to continue to do so with confidence, thereby lowering any sort of potential risk exposure that they may have to deforestation, illegalities, et cetera. Um, so that Thank I'll you, just, um, wrap, wrap up there, <laughs> speed <laughs> round, and um, yeah, if anybody has questions maybe later, and then feel free, my contact information is there, we can touch base offline. So thanks, appreciate it. Great. Thank, thank you very much, Simon. Much appreciated. And, and uh, let's, uh, as again, if you have questions, uh, we can kind of catalog those in the, um, in the chat, and we'll get to them uh, when we open up for conversation later. Let me turn uh, to Isabella from ProForest. Hello, everyone. Um, there you are. We can hear you. Yeah, you can hear me now, right? <laughs> yep. Okay. So um, I'm I'm just going to expand a bit more on on what Simon already touched upon. So we've produced last year uh, an overview of the different uh, traceability and and social environmental monitoring systems in place in Brazil, commissioned by the WWF Brazil in support of the work of the working group on indirect cattle suppliers. So what you're going to see here is just a, um, well, a summary of that, really. So uh, if we can move on to the next slide, please. So what we found was basically all of these um, uh, systems in place, they combine traceability tools and social environmental information. Um, the traceability level they either do it by looking at uh, batches of cattle, so just cattle lots, 
or uh, looking at individual animals. Uh, the use of individual animals in Brazil is, is very limited um, at the moment, but most of, most of the traceability happens um, looking at lots of animals. Um, please, next one. And there are two main strategies around how, how these systems have been set up. They are not exclusive. Uh, they, they live together quite happily. Uh, what, we, what we see is that there are systems that were put in place and where the key motivation and the effort comes out of the slaughterhouse and they put some controls in place to have you know, to ensure compliance through these control and blocking systems. Um, but there are also other, other initiatives in place in Brazil and I think you're going to hear um, from some of them uh, a bit later on how cattle ranchers may have the key motivation to send information to the slaughterhouse to be able to access some sort of program that provides assistance and rewards to them. So these two systems live uh, side by side in Brazil at the moment. Uh, next one, please. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because Simon has already mentioned how complex the supply chain can be. The key thing that you need to take from this is that if traceability and supply chain transparency is a challenge in any commodity, for cattle it's a bigger challenge because cattle moves and so there is a whole supply chain at farm level which doesn't normally happen uh, with uh, the other commodities, right? Um, so you can have very low visibility when you have all the three stages of production happening in different farms or you can have relatively high visibility of the supply chain when you have full cycle farms that contain all the different uh, processes. Next one, please. So, um, I can just stop there for a moment. I'm not sure if this is too small for you, but basically, um, so this is the complexity of the supply chain. What, what we see at the moment, what, what Simon was explaining, that the final farm actually has, next one please, um, sends information to the, to the slaughterhouse. That's where the traceability tools are coming into play. The key two um, aspects that are being requested is basically the GTA, which is a transport um, documentation. So every time you transport animals, live animals in Brazil, you need to have a document that goes with it and shows uh, where it's coming from and where it's going to. But it's just for that specific transit. Um, and they also ask for the car number. The car is the Environmental Rural Registry. Um, and then that information is used by the meat processor. Next one, please. It's usually processed by uh, some sort of monitoring uh, service provider. Uh, you can move forward. Um, just keep going. And then next one, please. There. So this, this monitoring service provider usually takes a lot of information on deforestation, uh, embargoed areas, slave labor, and uh, sometimes uh, other other information around indigenous lands and conservation units, um, environmental licenses and land tenure um, into consideration and they use their geoprocessing capacity to try and answer the question, does the final farm meet social environmental criteria for, uh, for the cattle purchase to go forward? If they have a green light, say the purchase is uh, authorized, if not, it's cancelled or blocked or suspended for some time until the producer can uh, produce more information. So the key question there is really, this is look like a very sophisticated system and it is and to a certain extent it's more advanced than what you can find in many other commodities, uh, this level of control for each purchase. But it doesn't, it doesn't answer all the questions because there is a whole supply chain before the final farm that is still invisible to the slaughterhouse. So how can that be improved? Um, you can move ahead, please. So one of the key things that every single uh, system uses right now is the GTA, which is this transit um, document that uh, each batch has to, has, has to have to go from one place to another. 
it has limitations because as you've seen it only records the last farm and nothing before that there are still paper documents going around in Brazil there's a, they're, they're available they're electronic available but if the if the system is down if there's any issue we are still allowed to use uh, paper documents um, it's not automatically integrated with the environmental information. It was created for sanitary purposes. And there's no transparency. Thanks, John. And there's no transparency. So that means it's really hard for anyone to use it for as a, as a, as a well, supply chain, train, chain transparency tool. But there are opportunities, and I'm sure Pedro, who's speaking after me, will, will elaborate on this. But it is the most widespread tool used in Brazil. At state level, they are already starting to look at solutions such as integrating the, the, uh, the GTA, which is the transit document, with the car, which is the, the environmental one. Um, so there are easy fix. You could easily link, you know, add information about previous farms on each GTA and that can be done on a voluntary basis. It would be better if it was um, if, if it was mandatory to do so, um, but that's a, it, it's a longer way to, to get there. So there are easy things that you can do, and you can start with stepwise approaches, increasing visibility of the next level, so the rearing farm. Um, it won't take us straight away to the breeding farm for sure, but at some, in some stages it may actually do that. So I'm going to stop here because I think Pedro is going to talk about a bit more about the, the proposed solution building on these opportunities that the GTFI has started to work on. So thanks very much. If you have so, any questions, just post them on the chat. Thank you very much, Isabella. Excellent. And let me just say I know there's been some chat about the, the, the clarity of the slides. We're working on that. There is a function on the left side of your screen where it shows a, a magnifying glass with a plus if, and you can expand the size of the slide hopefully that may help you a bit but we're working on that problem. Let me now go to, to Pedro for his presentation. Yeah hello, yeah, hello everyone. I'm going to talk a little bit more about what the GT5 uh, group is doing. Um, so my contacts are there then I'm pleased to answer any questions. Pedro you're breaking. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Next one, please. Anna, can you put the next one, please? Or okay. So the okay. So the GFI was actually founded, I would say, uh, almost three years ago. In June 2015, we had the first meeting where we joined an almost uh, 40 stakeholders. Uh, actually, the idea is to create a group to identify, develop and implement some uh, wide uh, traceability solution for indirect supplier. Uh, the key participants, I mean, we have the three large meat packs involved in that, the three large Brazilian retailers involved in that. We have some ranchers, uh, several NGOs. Uh, and in the second workshop we had in February, we also had the participations of some international brands. So Pesco, Max Benson, Hendo, they were all participating on a video conference um, as well. So the main result that we already got is actually got the recognition of the supply chain of the importance of the indirect supplier to avoid the depreciation. And now we're also trying to get alignment on a potential solution. So that's why we have reached to do the call the Proposta A, which I'm going to tell more details now. And this group is coordinated by a National Wide Federation and Amigos da Terra. Next one, please. Okay, so the proposed uh, it, app, it's actually based on uh, voluntary participation. So actually, we're inviting, uh, let's say, the, the ranchers and the meat packers to be part of the platform. Uh, it will utilize information from DTA and CAR to enhance the uh, traceability and monitoring. So those are the tools that are going to be used on the proposed as well. Uh, it's going to be developed with a platform for integrating integrate all those information. And we're thinking about having the PTA from the Minister of Agriculture to be one of the platforms that could be used because they have uh, access to the GTA. We're also thinking on utilizing risk zone mapping analysis. 
to differentiate the high and low risk areas. We think that that helps us to really move to a stepwise approach and to have different demand in terms of documents from different uh, areas, depending if it's a high or low risk. Uh, we have already initiated some simulations in Mato Grosso and Pará trial, which I'm going to show you on the next slide. And we are also trying to uh, bring big tax retailers to that. Uh, so here's just a quick uh, idea. Uh, we have already designed five concept trials for the Proposta A, and those are the three main ones that we're working on. So the first one is working with ICB and the Lobo Campo project uh, in Alta Floresta. Uh, I, I, I think everybody's aware of that program. It's a very interesting program. It will also involve some medium-sized meat packers on that. Uh, and we are going to try to see their systems of controlling direct and see how it fits with the proposal as well. Uh, it's going to be uh, going to reach around 30,000 uh, animals. The second one, it's a concept trial uh, to be done in Parai State. And it's going to cover the state ranch association was just created, the Acre Pará, the state meat pack association, the UNIEC, and also a strong geostation platform company, and to be confirmed, a large retailer. Uh, so we're going to do, uh, reach in the beginning, 15 large ranches, both in Paragomina with probably nine to 10 ranches in Hidden Zone with around five to six ranches. Um, the, the third one, it's uh, uh, um, a, trial, a concept trial in Mafrigi that uh, we're going to do uh, using um, a lot analysis and a risk zone analysis. So actually we're going to see how their systems are working out and how we can enhance it uh, and see how that would fit also in our uh, proposal. Next one, please. So, uh, okay, so the, the purpose of the concept Try it. You can put all of them, Anna. Uh, it's to assess the strength and weakness of the proposed approach in regards to cost, how easy it is to deal with that, and what's really the effect of the, the proposed task. So this is one of the, the ideas of the, of the, of the um, concept trial. The other one is really to see how we operationalize, operationalize GTA and CAR, because we understand those are the important tools for the monitoring the ingress. And also to obtain some inputs, uh, to really have a final protocol and so we have to decide what will be the cut update, what will be the, the process of inclusion on compliant direct supply. This is also very important deal. We want to have uh, some uh, inclusion of the farms that are not compliant now, trying to find a way to, to put them back on the system. And the last slide shows us uh, what will be uh, really the challenge and the opportunity. First of all is transparency. We're trying really to to get, some, uh, to get the GTA data and the CAR, and uh, we need some advocacy on that, uh, because there are two ways of trying to get the GTA. Either you have a voluntary uh, approach with the ranchers uh, giving you that information and including that information on their GTA, or we can get really the access to the government uh, database, which would be really the most efficient way of doing that. Uh, the other one I think which is very important, it's a challenge, is really to sign in find economic incentives uh, for the ranchers especially to promote their volunteer participation on the monitoring platform. I think that's also something we're looking for in different ways. And the last one is it would be an opportunity. And actually, we would like to have international players and even, you know, TFA associates to try to help us to promote this transparency needed in terms of GTA and CAR. Well, I think it was, I went too fast, I cover all the points, and so thank you very much, and uh, you can reach me on my contacts um, if you have any questions. Excellent, excellent, Pedro, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to suggest not seeing any questions uh, on the chat that we just keep moving, and again, that'll just give us more time for discussion at the end, so let me turn to Lela uh, for her comments about the work in Monte Grosso. Okay, hi everyone, good, mo good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah, it sounds like you may have some background noise in your... I think it's here, but...
Okay, are you hearing me? So good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to show you our work on, on cattle sourcing in Mato Grosso State. We develop a methodology for the diagnostics and try to see uh, the specific solutions that we could move forward on indirect suppliers. So uh, the guiding questions are, uh, we wanted to see how much uh, the indirect suppliers and where they are concentrated and also how much the rural settlements would be, uh, would have, will share, would have the share of indirect suppliers and uh, how all those variables is related to the first station. Uh, oh, so you don't have my presentation, I don't know why. Okay, share. Sorry for that. Are you okay now? Uh, I think it's, yeah, now it just came up, yes. Yeah. And so the, the purpose is to identify the sensitive areas, so the deforestation risk areas for cattle sourcing in Mato Grosso based on the indirect, indirect suppliers approach. So the methodology was uh, we just gather a lot of information, a lot of database in order to have a special analysis and, and, and a few economic analysis uh, regarding uh, uh, the breeding and rearing herd, calves, dairy cattle, deforestation, uh, we used car, a sample of the car to see the size of the farms that are concentrated in the municipality that has a high share of, of indirect suppliers and so on. So uh, uh, the first results, you can see that we select the few municipalities in Mato Grosso with high uh, deforestation rate, high recent deforestation rates and uh, high concentration of indirect suppliers and also the future the, the future risk of deforestation. So how much those municipalities would continue to have deforestation, high deforestation rates considering the indirect supplier share. So we selected those municipalities uh, and uh, we will, we look at each individually in order to have uh, what kind of solutions can we have for each of them in terms of zoning those areas and see the characteristics of each municipality. So uh, quickly, we can see, oops, sorry, you can see a few key messages of the study. So the study does not, did not estimate the causality between the indirect suppliers and deforestation, just the relationship of the municipalities that has higher rate uh, of indirect suppliers and high different deforestation rates as well. So what we saw in terms of numbers uh, of what those municipalities represent. So we are talking about 2.2 million calves, 32% of total calves of Mato Grosso State in high risk deforestation areas. Uh, this represents 7% of total herd in Mato Grosso and 31% of those areas has rural settlements with pasture land. We're talking about 2 million hectares of pasturelands on rural settlements that has high risk of deforestation. And 27% of total pasturelands in Mato Grosso. We are talking about one third of the pasturelands that can have high deforestation risk related to indirect suppliers. And in, in summary, we can, uh, we can correlate that 31% of cattle slaughtered in 2014 has uh, some kind of risk to have indirect suppliers related to deforestation. So, so this is not causality, not saying that 31% of total slaughter uh, had deforested, uh, came from deforested areas. We're just saying that the municipality that we selected has 31% of cattle slaughtered in 2014. 
So what we also uh, uh, did in this study was looking at the, each municipality individually. What is the characteristics of each of them and uh, uh, if there is a concentration of rural settlements so we can uh, not exclude the, the, those settlements from the market if we have like a, 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 high, uh, a high level uh, protocol for monetary system so we can exclude those uh, settlements on the market would cause other uh, social effects, uh, negative social effects. So what we saw is that uh, improving productivity and technical assistance must be effective in this, the, the municipalities that we list here because they have a high concentration of rural settlements and also they are they have a deforestation rate related to those rural settlements. Uh, municipality, munis municipalities that ha has high remina remaining vegetation with high concentration of, of indirect suppliers but must be must be observed. And uh, this is the case of Cáceres, Cocalim, Porto, Porto Espiridion. Municipalities with high con with concentration of deforested areas, but uh, 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 and also with indirect suppliers and continuously being deforested would be seven municipalities that we list there. So the efforts on monitoring systems, on monitoring high-risk high areas should be prioritized in those areas. So what we are saying is that you don't need to do the, the, the monitoring on all regions of Mato Grosso or, or another state that, that we are analyzing. But we should prioritize those municipalities where we can have the relationship between the indirect suppliers and high de deforestation rates. But also looking at the char characteristics of those municipalities in terms of the size of the firms, rural settlements, uh, in order to avoid uh, negative uh, impacts in terms of social uh, and economic. And also, we also want to... We just need uh, about 30 seconds to wrap up. Thank you. Okay. Include those produ producers into the PRA uh, program would be very important so they can, uh, they can have access to the market as well. This is, could be a solution for them to, to, to the compliance on the forest code, to the compliance of the farm in terms of environmental aspects. And in summary, we, we, we want to introduce this uh, sustainable, sustainable origination cluster or you can select a plant, a plant and see what is around it in terms of economic influence, looking at far, uh, size of farms and characteristics of the, 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 the suppliers so you can have specific actions in each of those areas. So this is what we propose of not only uh, staying at uh, the monitoring system uh, as a unique uh, way to move forward on, on indirect suppliers' uh, uh, actions. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, let me go now to Christopher uh, from Na the Nature Conservancy. Chris, your audio doesn't sound very good. Can you hear me now? Try to get closer to your microphone, perhaps. Maybe your internet connection. Yeah, that's not so good. John, can you switch to another person in my seven minutes to try and catch the mic? Yeah, why don't we... Um, uh, uh, can I go to um, Laurent or Eleni uh, to, while we work on Chris's um, presentation problem? Can you hear me? Yes, please. 
Okay, hello everyone. Uh, this is Laurent. Can you put the presentation on? Yeah, it's coming up, I think. Uh, just proceed and we'll get the presentation up for you. Okay, so PEXA is a Portuguese acronym for uh, Amazon Sustainable Cattle Ranching. It's a cattle ranching management firm. It's based in Northern Mato Grosso State. And what we do is uh, long-term partnerships with uh, landowners to reform degraded pastures and to implement a set of good practices that we call sustainable intensification uh, that allows to increase uh, six, seven-fold production on uh, already deforested areas. And this includes a claim to be fully zero deforestation. Uh, our operation is uh, based on rearing and fattening Thus, we, we purchase a large amount of uh, cows uh, from a large number of uh, suppliers, so of indirect suppliers. So the, the, uh, the challenge of controlling indirect suppliers uh, is uh, directly our challenge. So I want to show here how we, we do the control of uh, deforestation in our supply chain um, so that uh, we can supply our meat packers and their, and their clients with uh, verified zero deforestation. I think that the presentation is not in, in presentation mode. If you could do that, that would be helpful, please. Or maybe because uh, there was some, uh, some uh, problem in configuration. Anyways, so the, the building blocks of, uh, of our system, in order to do this control, we need basically three things. One is a clear and rigorous policy and, and a protocol to, to clarify it, a robust and functional monitoring system, and also external verification. So we'll go through these three elements. So next, the first one, uh, the policy. Uh, next. Okay, the policy. So PEXA's zero deforestation policy, no, back, is uh, that we do not uh, partner with ranches that have deforestation post-2008, independent of being legal or illegal, independent of being in priority areas or not. Or not. So it's a very uh, uh, bold statement. No involvement with recent deforestation. And this applies to all the suppliers of, uh, of uh, calves, but also of uh, corn, which is our main input. Uh, Additionally, we also have uh, in our policy full compliance with forest code, which includes restoring degraded forests. And to implement this policy, we have a protocol, Novo Campo protocol, that was developed together with uh, ICV and also with support from IMA Flora. It's basically a set of procedures to do them, define how the monitoring is done and what happens if any uh, non-conformity is observed. So next. Uh, now, yes, next slide. Now we, we have this, the, the second of the key pillars, which is the monetary sync system. So we use the platform developed by Tejas, which we find uh, is robust, uh, is uh, functional, and is affordable. And it allows us to check the compliance of uh, the ranches, the partner and the suppliers, and also to trace all the transactions. So next, the first step is to register uh, property. So uh, if it's a partner ranch, a potential partner or a potential supplier, we first register its boundaries and all the data. And then we click on the Busca button and get the result, which is on the next slide. Uh, with uh, all the indicators, and if uh, we have a green light on all, uh, it means that uh, we can move forward and do the partnership or uh, do the purchase. And next slide, now we have the other uh, key tool in the Terras platform that allows to register each individual transaction. So what you can see on the slide is uh, on the center, uh, a partner range, uh, PEXA range, and uh, the arrows uh, link to each of each, uh, its uh, cow suppliers. And if you click on any of these arrows, then you see uh, 
exactly the, the, all the transactions that were done with this uh, uh, specific supplier, including uh, the information of the GTA. So if you click on any uh, GTA, then you can see the detail of all the animals, their categories. Uh, so this is the, the level of, of control that we have. Um, so next, uh, so this is the, how the, the, the monitoring, this was how the monitoring works. And uh, all this gives the support for the, the independent verification. So we have an annual uh, verification which is uh, uh, typically commissioned by uh, a retail or food service partner. The, the one carried that last year was commissioned by McDonald's. And the next one will be done in, in uh, next month. So this, uh, all this information basis is what is necessary for uh, these auditors to, to do the verification. So especially if they go to any of uh, our ranches, they can uh, obtain the GTA extract from the government and check in our system if all the transactions that we have re registered correspond to the ones that are uh, in, the, in, the, in the government system. So, a minute left, Larry. Okay, so we can go to, to the last slide. So that's what, what I had about, specifically about uh, control. Now, all this is uh, only one side of the solution. Uh, with uh, with a partner with breeders with uh, indirect suppliers and I would say this is the easy one uh, because uh, the tools are, are available and I, I we think that uh, no large cattle ranching operation should find it difficult to implement these kind of tools and uh, I think there is a lot of progress to be done here because we don't know of many others who do that. Uh, but uh, what is more challenging and that is also necessary to uh, develop uh, this solution in the, in the long term is uh, also supporting the breeding uh, ranches to implement the good practices. Because this is what is going to, to guarantee on the long term that they are able to continue providing good quality products and, uh, and also make the best possible use of uh, their already deforested land. So to do this, we are now uh, developing, testing, uh, also a model of long-term partnership with, uh, with partner breeders, which uh, I think will, will make uh, all this uh, approach more complete. So that's what I have. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much. And thanks for jumping up in the order so efficiently. Chris, do we have you back perhaps on a better audio? Maybe. How do I sound? That's better. Yeah, let's try that. Okay, let's do it. So thanks everybody. I'm standing in for Francisco Fonseca who leads our work in Sao Felix Machine Group. So I'll give you an overview. We were afraid uh, Shiku might not be able to make it in time for this call. So next slide. A bit of context, project in Sao Felix Machine Group, uh, selected because we think of it as kind of a microcosm of the deforestation frontier in the Southern Amazon. Uh, 2.3 million total cattle, beef cattle in the San Felix region. Uh, we have 16 demonstration ranches in our pilot project that have a total of 46,000 hectares. So it's a pilot project, but reasonably large. Those ranches uh, slaughter 500 animals per month and produce 70 tons of beef. Next slide. This project uh, goes deep in a triple bottom line approach. So we, we work very intensively with our pilot ranches. Uh, doing environmental work, such as intensification on their cleared land, uh, car, restoring pasture and forests. Uh, social work, which is capacity building for about 200 people in San Felix so far. Uh, founding, uh, working with 23 member ranches to create a producer's association, so a lot of social capital. Improving working conditions on the ranches and improving animal welfare and nutrition on the ranches. Uh, and a lot of work in the economic sphere as well. We've established a Popa Tempo, which is a uh, literally translated as a time saver. It's kind of a one-stop shop for all of your bureaucratic needs. Um, we helped work, uh, lead, lead a land tenure task force, which we think is a, taking key steps in unlocking uh, public sector loans. Uh, we've helped establish the first municipal ABC loan program. So that's the low carbon credit programs. And we hope to have a number of people taking that credit uh, in the next year. 
we've seen productivity increase 54% on our pilot. And we've launched the Hibani of Shingu, or the Shingu Herd Seal. It's not a certificate, but it's a uh, differential on the market, and that's for sale at Walmart via Marfrig. Um, next slide. So all that to the good, but we still have a problem, which as we've discussed today, is the indirect flyers. Um, in our experience in Shingu, you know, we know that we know that slaughter houses really only have visibility to their direct suppliers. Uh, but we also know that in the San Felix region, we've got 900 properties or so that are under embargo by Obama and the Federal Environmental Agency. And we know that they continue to produce cattle, and we know that those cattle don't die in the field. Right? So we are sure that they reach market somehow. Um, at the same time, we've seen an uptick recently in deforestation rates, and we've seen productivity or production rather, total production increase in zone phallics, uh at a rate higher than what would be accounted for by our increasing productivity on existing pasture. So it's just further evidence that we are seeing continued deforestation there, despite the fact that the direct suppliers are apparently within these controlled supply chains. Uh, so we know there's leakage. We need to bring indirect suppliers into legitimate supply chains. Next slide. Um, so we have tried uh, electronic ear tags. We've tried uh, bolus or, or sort of in the, the bolus uh, individual tracking. We agree that that's, you know, the gold standard. It's the perfect way to see pretty much everything you want about a cow. Uh, but in our experience, it was too expensive and too intensive on the management side for our ranchers out on, on the frontier was just too hard. So we're trying a different approach, which is very similar to things you've heard about already on this, on this set of presentations, uh, which is to link existing systems, uh, the GTA and the, and the car and the sort of this, uh, to provide a good enough answer, um, creating risk uh, slices for different ranches and, and applying those to individual animals. Uh, we think it provides a pragmatic and inexpensive approach, uh, which we think is what is needed to scale this up. Next slide. So how does this work step by step? Uh, first, our member producers assign, uh, they sign an agreement with the producers association in which they agree to a set of standards and they permit the association to access their GTA, their individual transport uh, paperwork for each cow uh, sold or, or purchased. Uh, the standards are what you might expect, car, uh, no deforestation, no slave labor, no child labor, uh, no overlap with protected areas or indigenous territories. Uh, perhaps a couple others that I'm forgetting. Um, TNC then through a, through a agreement with the association can, can access those GTAs and cross-references them with CAR and CRODIS, uh, again, publicly available systems. Um, and that allows us to create a risk level um, for each range which ranges from zero, which is extremely low risk. We pretty much know that there's no deforestation happening there, up to a three. Um, then we track the animals, which are, are going from ranch to ranch, and they just get an average of all of the ranch's scores on which they've lived. So a cow that was maybe born on a level three high risk deforestation ranch and transported to a level zero, uh, turns out to be a 1.5 cow. Um, and then the processors, and have this as a tool at their disposal to choose what they consider an acceptable risk level. Not a minute left, Chris. Okay, so meanwhile, the indirect suppliers, have a lot, they agree to create these uh, logs of their herds in which they're recording births, deaths, purchases, sales, uh, which allow us to again create uh, risk indices for them. And they agree to allow TNC to conduct on-site evaluations if we find them to be high risk. Next slide. And the, the, these logs of births and deaths are also used as a double check on the producer association members. Uh, they let us do some analyses such as herd size versus pasture area. We can, we can tell when numbers just don't add up. It's the same approach being used by Obama and the Carney Fria operation. So we think that there's real potential there for um, deepening the, the view into indirect suppliers. Next slide. Just to sum up then, um, the key takeaways, um, 
In our experience, scale requires us to be cheap and simple. We can't let the perfect become the enemy of the good. Uh, secondly, we need to be careful not to exclude producers, uh, labeling them bad actors and eliminating them from supply chains forever. Instead, we need to bring them into our system and gradually push them toward cleaning up their herd. And third, as you've heard today, market signals are the key to having broad uptake of any approach, whether that's tags or, or database management. Um, folks just aren't going to sign up for these things unless there's some kind of a, a carrot. Uh, we've heard from our producers that that could be a price differential, but it can also be things like preferential sales agreements. So there's different options on the table. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you, and I want to thank those who are registering some questions in the in the chat, which we will take after our next two speakers. So let me turn to Eleni uh, uh, to speak about her work. Uh, could you get a little little closer to your mic? You're a little uh, echoey. Thank you. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Try now. Okay, can you hear me? Is it better now? Yeah, that's that's better. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Great. Um, I'm just waiting for the first slide, please. Uh, yeah, please get started, and then we'll we'll get okay. the slides up as quickly as possible. Okay. Okay. So. Um, Aliança da Terra, for those who don't know us, we are a government organization in Brazil. We have been working hand in hand with rural producers since 2006. Our mission is to integrate, is to help them to adopt best practices, agricultural practices, taking into consideration respect for people and natural resources. We believe that empowering rural producers we give them the value um, that is necessary to generate new business uh, opportunities with the supply chains. Um, please, next step, next slide. Well, our backbone is the producing rice platform. And this slide shows uh, the dynamics of the platform. We have been working with, with several um, several rural producers, we don't take into consideration their size or type of production. Um, so here we have our team is comprised by forest engineers and uh, agronomers and environmental engineers. So this technical team is goes uh, to each farm uh, to pay visits to collect data. The data that we collect in every single farm that's part of our platform um, is we look into the environmental, social, and production aspects of this farm. The protocol that we use, uh, it was, it's, it's benchmarked with uh, several um, certifications, uh, international certifications, as well as taking consideration the Brazilian legislation. Um, after collecting the data in each farm, we process the information generating the social environmental diagnosis. This is a very comprehensive document that we give back to producers, and our technical team work with them on a action plan to find, to make literally a, 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 a specific planning on the continuous adequation of, of the negative aspects of each farm. All this data is made available in our web-based platform, and the idea is to, to have it as a transparent mechanism where markets, rural producers, and consumers can access the information of these producers, showing uh, the idea, basically, the platform serves as a window um, for the for the responsibilities taken by each producer. Next slide, please. Well, our platform has engaged over 1,000 farms uh, in 14 states of Brazil, plus Mexico, Paraguay, and Colombia. Uh, the total information uh, in our platform is is the equivalent of 5 million hectares. Next, please. 
So, even though we have a very large base of information, uh, we are looking into scaling up the impact of the, the service that the platform pays to, to rural producers. So we have created the Producing Rights app. This is, um, here's the next one, because it's going to have four steps that we'd like to explain. This app was, was developed in partnership with Body Control. It's a startup company um, specialized in the, in the production management um, systems as well. So this is an inclusive system, okay? So the, 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 applic the application um, is split into four stages. We are currently working, uh, we have the first stage fully operational, but the idea is to have um, all four working to the level of the diagnosis that we have today, that's the validation in the field. So right now, um, with the, a geographical location point, plus, this, um, plus the social security ID number of the rural producer or the company registry, um, it's, once you insert it into the, the app, the app already makes the cross-checking of embargo list, slavery uh, labor list, and also the the conflict with institutional institutional lens as well. So a basic uh, basic information is cross checked with public lists, generating uh, a, a very quick report. Please the next uh, slide. Yeah, about um, a minute left. Okay, uh, so this is the lab. So this is the report that each, each producer is going to have access immediately using the app. The next thing is in the next slide, please. Is the last one? Okay. So because of the work that we have been doing for so long with rural producers, we were approached by Grupo Pão de Açúcar, one uh, a large retail player in Brazil, um, because. Together with all the other retail players, they are, they are still the, co the, the commitment to monitor the origin of the beef that they sell in their stores. So, um, using our app, we found a way, we offered a way to, to monitor their ranchers supplying beef to the slaughterhouses that GPA commercializes uh, with. So, we through coupons, we, we, we Aliança da Terra provides codes to the app. Those codes are given to slaughterhouses that work with GPA, uh, and the slaughterhouses distribute these codes, the app codes, to their suppliers, to the ranchers. So the moment that each ranger enters the basic information on step one of the app, uh, the app links the information of the slaughterhouse with their producer, and this information goes straight to the retailer. So that makes it easier for GPA to trace um, the information, the social uh, environmental information of each beef producer without depending on the slaughterhouse. This information that's gathered by the app comes up to a traceability system that GPA uh, has with safe trace. Um, and this brings uh, qualified information to the traceability system that they have in place. So, well, well just two more points. Uh, with regards to, to the producers who do not um, who present problems, social environmental problems, GPA, through this, uh, the application of this um, analysis, basic analysis, where they can help the development of each supplier each supplier to improve themselves and get to to best on track to become suppliers of the of the of the chain of the container chain. Uh, in the second, in the next step is going to be uh, applying the system, expanding the system to the direct uh, direct um, suppliers. Um, so we can advance one more step into the monitoring system that's so much needed. Thank you, everyone. Very good. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh,
I'm going to turn to Francisco for just a, a few closing observations. He does not have any slides, but he'll make a few comments. And then I would ask those um, presenters to review the chats because we're going to be asking some of you to respond to some of these questions that you see uh, directed to one or more of you. So you might get ready for that uh, as Francisco wraps up. Francisco? Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, I just want to make clear that uh, uh, for those who visit us uh, during the TSA General Assembly, I am the same guy that uh, you visited in Alta Floresta. So I work for ICD, but now here I am speaking uh, from the GTPS perspective uh, as the, the, the Brazilian Roundtable. Uh, for those who don't know us, the GTPS is the Brazilian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. We, we, are the, we were the first roundtable around the world to uh, discuss sustainable cattle ranching, uh, and uh, now we are part of the, the Global Roundtable. Um, talk uh, after all those, those fabulous presentations <laughs> are quite not uh, necessary, but I just want to touch some points that I uh, hear today. Um, first of all, uh, GTPS is is in favor of uh, zero deforestation uh, in Brazil, just as long as we have some kind of compensation for uh, those cattle ranchers that uh, still have some uh, areas that they can deforest uh, legally. Uh, so uh, illegal deforestation is out of the table, but for those who have the right to deforest some area, uh, doesn't matter if it is on the Amazon or this farm, the Sahado biome. Uh, for us, we need to find um, a way to compensate them uh, so they can be part of uh, zero deforestation commitment. But we, in that way, we support this and we are working on to find those uh, these these ways to make some kind of compensation. Uh, about the presentations, uh, yeah, uh, we are totally uh, we totally agree that we 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 really need to support the smallholders uh, because they are, in the average, responsible for uh, six to two seven percent of the cattle. Uh, Cow-cow operations here in, in Mato Grosso State, and uh, it's I believe it is the same uh, all around Brazil. So we need, really need to support them and find ways to uh, to do it. So to implement those uh, technical assistance to them, so we can have uh, a full uh, value for the, well, or a full production chain uh, working on sustainable way. To do this, uh, we are working in the same way that most of the guys here. Uh, we are working with in partnerships, trying to get together all the value chain, uh, bringing financial solutions, bringing together uh, commercial agreements, and uh, uh, working with all our uh, partners or associated with, uh, uh, under the GTPS, uh, so PECS is already uh, associated to, to GTPS, as well as uh, NWF, uh, Amigos da Terra, ProForest, and uh, AgroEquity, and everybody here. So uh, we are among friends, and we are uh, all, everybody working on the same way. Um, and just to to close, uh, we want to share with you that we already have some tools uh, to implement those uh, those solutions. Uh, from GTPS, we have a manual, good practices manual that uh, we already developed together with Embrapa, the rural research center here in Brazil, and we also have some indicators. Uh, sustainable uh, indicators 
for the whole value chain that we already developed and uh, in which we are working on a platform so everybody can access it and work um, to analyze their own, own uh, uh, operations and uh, make sure that uh, in what they can uh, go forward and be better in terms of sustainability. Uh, those indicators are aligned with uh, uh, the global roundtable indicators. Uh, so we are all working on the same track uh, and also aligned with uh, those indicators from the US roundtable and the Canadian roundtable and also with uh, the SAI platform. So uh, I believe that everybody around the world is working to have the same result, to have a more sustainable uh, cattle operations. Uh, and I think that, uh, that's, that by now it's all that I have. Uh, and thanks, thanks many thanks for TFA to bring us this opportunity to talk more about sustainability. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Francisco, and thanks to all the presenters for providing such excellent information in a very concise way. Um, I want to go right to the some of the questions that have appeared in the chat, and I see several um, that I might ask perhaps Chris you to start with, and maybe other panelists want to respond to. There's there's one here about the the question of uh, um, transparency and and uh, what buyers are willing to do in terms of uh, those issues and also a question directly to TNC about Paraz Animal Health Agency linked to the in the GTA relationship to the car and then also this question about leakage so Chris maybe you could respond to a couple of those in one set of comments and then we can see if anybody else wants to add and then I'll go to a couple other questions absolutely um, and the first thing I would say is I'd like to actually connect some of the, the asters directly back to Toshiko Fonseca to really get the right answers here um, absolutely and we yeah we'll, we'll we'll make sure that happens yes yeah so Paulo uh, I don't know the answer I think that you've gotten right to the to the heart of it right if the buyers are really going to demand this and we'll come up with solutions to it um, Mona good enough answers um, I guess I would say this is kind of a Pareto principle thing. We think in our experience that we could probably get 80% right with 20% of the effort. And to get the last 20% right, it's going to take 80% of the effort. Um, so we would advocate for not being afraid to just start with getting it 80% right uh, simply and quickly. So sort of this GTA car product linkage uh, sort of an approach. Um, and in particular, taking a herd approach rather than a individual animal approach at first. Um, however, then we get into uh, Mateos's question about avoiding leakage from indirect suppliers. Uh, essentially, what you can do is that once you've identified potential problem ranches using this quick and dirty, easy approach, uh, you can get in there and, and do individual audits. You can check up on the information they're providing. Uh, you can do more statistical analysis. It just begins to increase the cost. So we come back to the same question that Pablo asked is how much are people willing to pay for what quality of information? Um, let's see. I see a question about the, the yeah. task force. We'll definitely have to send a message about that, but I will definitely help make that connection. And uh, I think that closes it for me. Great, Chris. Thanks, Simon. Let me. This question. There was a uh, again. This question about the linkage between GTA and CAR. You talked about that a bit. As as did Chris. Do you have any additional thoughts on that uh, question from Alan? Yeah, about the, so the what, integration yeah. of of those two systems. Yeah, I think that was the uh, that was the thrust. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's a really good question. I mean, the the exact sort of technical details of how that how those systems can actually communicate is something that is still being worked through through the GTFI and a lot of the other groups are exploring sort of ways that, that these systems can integrate but I think it's really important to highlight that the some of the the work that we've heard from some of the pilots and the the, the commitments um, that the meat packers have implemented 
actually rely on many different systems to sort of pull in um, the relevant data and then the sort of um, all sort of cross reference in a way that enables efficient decision making. So it's not just the GTA or the car or Protus. There's um, other sort of important spatial layers, um, including indigenous um, territories, conservation units. Um, there's even the, the uh, Brazilian slave labor list that's, that's cross-referenced as well. So there's a lot of different information systems that are already being sort of pulled in to the meatpacker uh, monitoring and purchase control systems that they utilize. And this, and this is uh, the idea behind this, the, the, what the GTFI and many others have, have spoken about, is that um, we utilize those existing sort of platforms and just pull in a little bit more information. That provides the opportunity to increase visibility um, further upstream into some of those, um, in, to that indirect supplier level. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to do that technically, uh, but basically at a from a property level approach, the car provides obviously the, the polygons of the property and that there needs to be some um, unique identifier that links that car property to the, the GTA or, or series of GTAs that run through that that eventually make their way to the meatpacker. So um, okay. pulling all that together information, then it, it's the idea is that it's integrated into these existing systems that already pull in various pieces of information from a lot of different other systems. Great. Thank, thank you, Simon. Um, Paolo, I know you have a couple, I paraphrased several of your questions here. I just wanted to see if you had anything you wanted to follow up on with any of the, the panelists in addition to what you've heard. And then I'll turn to uh, Laurent to respond to a couple questions. Okay. Um, uh, Laurent, there's a question here about the asking you to say just a bit more about the uh, the, the land tenure task force that you mentioned. I from Nicole. I th I think this maybe it was in someone else presentation. Okay. No <laughs> land tenure task force. Yeah, um, I think that's on our side, I, but I will definitely I, get sheep with to send a specific, you know, a written answer about that later. That's Chris. All right, thanks, Chris, very much. Um, I, I just wanted to, so maybe to go ahead. Yes, please. A little bit about this this question about uh, leakage. So, Mateus, okay. uh, I'm not yes. sure whether Mateus was meaning leakage as. Um, Indirect suppliers laundering someone else's uh, uh, production or calves produced in uh, in illegal areas, or if this means um, uh, the, the the indirect suppliers that are, that are not included in the controlled supply chains. So if it's uh, about laundering, I think uh, in the end the only the only solution that uh, can be really effective is that we have long term relationships uh, with established uh, suppliers so that uh, there is no interest and there is no no possibility of uh, uh, our suppliers uh, taking the risk to to launder someone else's uh, illegal production so I think uh, this is why the the control system is not by itself is not enough. It has to be uh, also uh, complemented by the establishment of long-term partnerships that uh, depend on cooperation, on technical, on uh, on the financing aspects. Uh, now, if we talk about the 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 producers that are not included in the supply chain control. Uh, then only a comprehensive government-based solution could uh, could solve that. And our vision is uh, it has to be, uh, it's very simple. Only issue a GTA if the property is not embargoed. That would, that would solve, you know, 90-plus uh, percent of everything. It would not re require disclosure of uh, information. But uh, it depends on the, on the government uh, being willing to do that. Uh, while this does not happen, we, we want to, to reinforce that the tools are available 
So if the buyers want to uh, require control of the indirect suppliers from their uh, meat packers, they can do it because there are tools to do that. And uh, as I was saying, large scale or mid even medium scale cat ranching operations can perfectly uh, use these tools uh, just as uh, medium scale um, uh, meat packers are uh, already starting to, to use these tools. The point I wanted to make. Thanks. Very good. Laurent, there's a, not just while you have the microphone, Tatiana had a question about um, the, um, where was it? Oh, here it is. Uh, about the, do you buy Pesca buy cattle only from farms in which ranchers have land title? We don't check for land titles for buying. Now, if we're going to establish a long-term partnership, including investing on the supplier's range, then we have to check for land title. But for a, a, a purchase, we only check uh, the car and the other criteria related to deforestation, to uh, no embargo, et cetera, as the, the same criteria as the, the meat packers. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, I know there there's a, a number of, co go ahead, please. Sorry, there, there was a question about costs of monitoring and tracking. Yeah, uh, go ahead, very good, yes. Uh, cattle ranching, you know, it's uh, very high values. One cow is uh, one, one animal is very expensive. So the cost of uh, tracing is very low compared to the, the price of the product. So that's, that should not be an issue. Uh, the issue is much more the, the opportunity cost of not buying from illegal suppliers. But uh, the cost of the tools is, uh, is not a relevant issue. Very good. Thank you for answering that one. Let me just say we just have a minute or two left. A uh, couple um, aspects for the going forward. We will make sure that, first of all, this has been recorded, this, this webinar, so that'll be, uh, we will be making sure you know and your colleagues know how to get to the link if you wish to uh, share this uh, information with others. We will also make sure the slides are all available uh, outside of the formal webinar process so that you can um, uh, access those clearly um, and apologize for any technical challenges along with came with the slides today, though overall I think it worked pretty well. Um, but you can get any of that information directly. There's also some, been some very good exchange on the chat of individuals responding uh, with offers of, of connection and assistance and really that's at the heart of of what the Tropical Forest Alliance is all about is connecting partners to, to further this very important work on deforestation uh, and in this case in, the, in, the, in this supply chain. So would encourage you to um, review those uh, chats and pick up on any of those conversations via email or offline. Fabiola is here to, to help you. So if there's any emails or connections that you don't see uh, or don't have adequate information on, please uh, feel free. We'll review these questions uh, one more time. If there's any uh, specific questions that we just didn't have time to uh, respond to, we will make sure that we do our best to, to give you a, uh, a follow-up to those specific questions. And I want to turn it over to Fabiola for just for some closing comments. Fabiola, are you on mute? Anna, yes, no, I was, uh, okay. No, just yeah. to say goodbye to everybody. Thanks again, John, thanks all the speakers, thanks all the participants. I uh, just want to highlight that this is the first but not the last for sure, not, not for this topic and not for other topics what could interest for the network in Latin America and TFA globally. So thanks, but, uh, uh, highlighting and, and uh, we will follow all of this.